I'm Device from Astralis and welcome to Foreign's YouTube channel. It's a joke free zone. Right, this is going to be another episode of Reflections and my guest for this one is going to be Blizzard who is an old school German Counter-Strike player and if people are interested, this isn't just one where it's like boomers talking about Counter-Strike. Actually, there's a relevant reason why I'm doing this particular interview now which is he's actually just come back to CSGO who he's going to be involved now and he's obviously taking a big position at Big Clan, understandably the German team. So let's go way back in time, Blizzard because one of the interesting things people might not know, it actually might be quite shocking because in CSGO, Germany actually wasn't very well represented. Like there wasn't many times there was a team, you know, contending for the top spot. Oftentimes, like a German team would be, it'd be to me, it came like ninth in a tournament, you know, or had like one or two good players. The scene obviously isn't as strong as it was. And as I've just said there, by as strong as it was, I think actually a lot of fans would be shocked if they knew how developed esports was in Germany in Counter Strike in the 2000s. Like actually, it was one of the strongest scenes domestically. Obviously, you guys had the EPS, which at the time was far and away the best domestic league in the whole world world of Counter-Strike. You could win a lot of money if you won that. Yeah. I think it was like 15,000 euros or something. And then all, obviously with this whole like sort of infrastructure where you have all these teams, everyone competing, it meant the international teams were very strong. So if people don't know, even when you came along and started playing and getting to the top level, we're talking like 2003, 2002, there was already an established scene, right? There was already top teams. There was already, in fact, some of the names people know, SK Gaming, Mouse, what, these teams were all around, right? Yeah. Like, especially, like, for mouse sports, I think that was, um, like, after MTW, the first really, like, strong team from Germany. We always had, like, a really decent team. Like, we had a lot of teams, like, um, also Alternate Attax, MTW, SK Germany, Okrana. Yes. There are, like, well, like, a lot of, like, teams back then, but I would, um, I don't agree that, like, we were, like, in the, um, we didn't really have, like, the international peak. Like there were only like I think like mouse sports um, who could compete like for the uh, big titles from I think 2002 until 2007. Um, but there were like a lot of players. But um, I think one of the biggest issues we had like in Germany were like we had like a really weak internet like compared to the Scandinavian right. guys. Yes. So I think that was like a big um, advantage for the Scandinavian scene like when they attended like LAN events. For and sure. Still, I think, um, like for mouse sports and alternate attacks, they did really well, also like international. And um, as you also mentioned, like the ESL with the pro series, like we had like a lot of German tournaments where we can, uh, where we could win a lot of money. And that was also, I think, like one advantage which we had like in the German scene, like um, to develop and also like um, to have a lot of good and strong players and teams. Right, okay, so interestingly enough, as you said, mouse sports, all the attacks, all these teams. Well, the interesting thing, if people don't know, is you actually made your name in a team you didn't mention there because it wasn't a big org. It was just a couple ah, of lineups who were in. Yes, of course, Advanced Online Losers, by the way, hilarious name. But yeah. it, it basically, it was the team that if people don't know, there's three key players came from this squad and went on to bigger things. Obviously, Johnny R, who'd previously been in mouse sports, was a big deal. Neo, yeah. not the one from Poland. It will, bizarrely, this one was half Polish and half German. Yeah. Obviously, he was in that team. And then you, you were the other person who came along, right? At the yeah. time you came along in this team, like, this wasn't one that had the same background, right? Aside from basically when Johnny R came a bit later, weren't, didn't your teams kind of come up together? You were like, you, were, you weren't the top players at the time, right? You were kind of like underdogs and, and new players, right? I think we came, like, back then, I think that must be, like, in 2002, like, I played for Insanity Circuits, like, with Coolfire, Grey Fox, some might know them, like, from SK Germany later on. Like, we were just a team, like, we were picking, like, good German player, players, but I think also in Season 1 of the EPS, we didn't even attend it, because oh, okay. we were, like, some kind of um, the um, the spectators or the community in Germany, they marked us as a online team. And then okay. like, uh, we had also to qualify like online for the EPS for the second season. And that was like the first time when we really had like, um, also strong performances online. You had like this, um, ESL Friday night games. And then, um, for some reason, or maybe for some reason, like we really performed well also at the finals of the um, second season where we beat, I think, Mouse twice. Yeah. And that was like really our breakthrough. But like back then, we were like some, like, we weren't really, really a very important team for the German scene. They just started in summer 2003. And yeah, and you know the story. <laughs> One thing I want to ask is, because like, I know the outside of the scene was like, but if you're in a team like this, not not as professional as a mouse sports or all attacks, if you're in one of these squads, what is the structure of the team like? Like, Do you actually have a lot of like set practices? Are people trying to be professional? Is the goal to actually be pro players? Are you just playing because you're good players? What was it like? 
I mean, also like at that time, you were also um, preparing with your teams for like um, bigger matches and events. Like we also regularly attended like some smaller LAN or smaller and medium sized um, LAN parties in Germany. And still, all of us were like pretty ambitious. Like as you also said, like three players from us then got, I would say, like promoted to most sports. Like everyone has like um, the will to play on top. But uh, we also had like our um, practice schedules. I wouldn't say it was like much different than to my time like at Mousebots. But um, still, I think um, every one of us worked hard at that time. And then um, it, I wouldn't say it isn't coincidence, but we worked hard like to get like on the next level. As you said, obviously the fear at the time if you weren't in an established team is like someone's just an online and you know they won't be as good on LAN. So when uh-huh. this uh, Air, Lo- Air Losers team started going to the LANs, and this summer was a massive breakout because you went to the Game Goon tournament, which if people don't know was a tournament that was always held in Spain. And usually it wasn't like the top, top teams like SK Gaming didn't go or whatever. It would usually be like what you'd call now like tier two, like the, like they say the third or fourth best Swedish team. You might have like, you know, this other squads of this level, right? When you won this tournament even, that's not the best teams in the world. No one can maybe know how good you are. So when you went to the CPL summer, this is a tournament, right? Which if people don't know at the time had the most prize money ever. It was enormous. Like even I think third place was like 30,000 or something. And your 30,000 yeah. used to be first place. So this was like at the time, like everyone was just going crazy for this one tournament. And your team obviously did a very impressive result by coming fourth. I think it actually shocked a lot of people. What would you say about this time period? What was this experience like? It was like really hard to imagine that like within one month everything was changing. Like it started with the pro series we wanted, then we attended like as I said like the Spanish game given where we I think the first prize was ten thousand euros, but um, also like the travel and accommodation to the CPL, and then like within like this three or four weeks like for from one to the other minute we were like one of the I think most talked about teams at that time. Like because we came from nowhere and then like within um, several weeks we made it like to the top and I think it was kind of unbelievable but it also like gave us a lot of um, I would say self-confidence like for our matches I think even afterwards like um, after the CPL we also attended I think an event like in Valencia which we also won I think we played against four kings and some yes. other Swedish teams there and that was also like a lot of stuff changed during that time for me personally, but also I think also for the other players like in the Adelsus team. One of the key players I referred to it earlier that was known, obviously, was Johnny R. You got the infamous Johnny R. The Orper from Mouse Sports, actually. He'd been in Mouse Sports. Where people don't know, like, Mouse Sports actually was having, like, certain problems. They obviously didn't win the EPS, so, you know, tournaments that at the time they were just expected to win. They were the big favourites. Right, I want to ask you about this player because if people don't know, it's funny now, dude, because because actually of all these land performances you had with teams like yours and Mouse Sports, people now remember him as a great player, but if they don't know, he was actually considered probably the most infamous onliner earlier in his career. Like, he had loads of demos, basically, that looked amazing but it was sort of him just like wrecking like you know not very good teams or people questioned did he cheat or something right when he came to your team it must have been a big deal right you get like a, a top player who's come into your squad so who was this guy what how do you explain this player to me i think johnny or jonas like he's a really interesting player because i think um when he does something he's really focused on it like you can ask him for um, like for any detail in counter-strike even in your config he can tell you like what the impact if you should do that if you shouldn't right. do that and he's like really if he's um starting with a project then he will be like 150 percent like in it and that was also like for those um four other players in the Adelsus team, it was like a completely new experience to play with such an established and famous guy who also told you like a lot of um, things which improved our gameplay, which improved us personally. And so like at that time, it was really, really a big deal to play with such a player. And as I said, like it was, I wouldn't say it, I would say it was also like an honor to play with such a player. And I think he was also one of the reasons why we um, could suddenly <coughs> perform at such a high level because he also bring a lot of stuff from all sports, like which he knew from all sports, how to do the tactics, how to do the gameplay, also team play. So there were like some specific points which I think um, boosted us to the next level. 
one thing I always thought on this topic of like, you know, big name players is I always noticed because the German and famously the Danish scenes were very focused on like a structured style of play, tactical counter strike. People might know it's still the same today, but though it's still the same sort of heritage that's come down. Mm-hmm. I've noticed if you have that style of play, I mean, it's kind of like German football. It doesn't mean, it means that typically the team is what wins. It's not one player. Yeah. You don't have like one player like simple on equal where, you know, the team loses, but they score like in this football equivalent, five goals. That doesn't really happen. But uh, so as a result to me, when you have the rare play, players who come along who like do stand out in a team like that it means to me they must be really good so the player I want to ask about is what I mentioned earlier which is Neo and as I said it'll be confusing to people now because they won't know that the Neo they think I'm talking about is obviously the <laughs> Polish one from the great teams that won the majors and at the time we didn't almost know who this guy was he was coming along like a year or two later this was the Neo Michael Matrega who was obviously he was technically like half Polish but obviously he listed as German and he played in these great teams obviously played in the next mouse sports team with you right this I remember this CPL especially he was one of the players that Everyone was like, who the hell is this guy? If you hadn't been watching EPS, because it's like this guy, this guy's way too good. Have we never heard of this guy? <laughs> like, was he was he as good as as advertised? Who was this guy? I think like he was uh, like he was or still is like a pretty calm guy. Also, like in the game, like he was always one like um doing his stuff, getting his kids, getting his positions done. Like he was uh, very reliable when we played with him. And I think that was also like one of the key reasons why we had this um, success also in A losers, but also later on in mouse sports. I think like also in mouse sports, like I joined first and then it was like the next decision, uh, decision like to take him also like from the A losers team because he was also like a key factor there. And as I said, skill wise, I think he was like at the top, top level. And you could always like tell him. We also had like some tactics that's like um, on Dust 2 when we play T side, we said, okay, the other, other guy go like towards B, probably for a B split, and just let Neo go along with an AWP, just solo. And like, I think like 70, 80% of that round, he just got like two or three kills, like with okay. his AWP from long. And we had like a real, really, really easy round. And that was also like, because we can't, usually <coughs> you don't give that much of, um, I wouldn't say like power, but responsibility of one yes. one-to-one player. But at that time, we knew like he's capable of. We, he also knew like what is his, um, what he can play like in the best way, and he really knew how to do, get it like in the in a positive way for the team. And that was also like I think one really key aspect um, of Leo at that time. Right. On paper, even if someone looks at the Liquipedia, they're going to understand why someone would leave this team here loses, even after these results and go to Mouse Sports, because they know Mouse Sports is a professional organization. I'm sure you know, it was one of the teams that had salaries, etc. But there's another good reason why, which is if you think of some of the names I'm mentioning, this Mouse Sports team that you joined, for me, was like that was like the German super team. That was like nearly all the players there, just the absolute best players in Germany. In fact, when this team was made, it was the first time I ever really thought. Dude, they might actually be able to win the CPL. In fact, obviously, people will know after this. You were right. You, you were ju- Listen, you weren't quite their level. You were like just below the absolute best Swedish teams, which at the time were just the best teams in the world, right? So give me some thoughts on this team. Like, would you agree? Was it the super team? And and what do you think of, like, this time it wasn't like a fluke when you have a, a, a top placing. And now it's expected. You should be a top team, right? I think we were a top team at that time. I think we also proved that um, for many years. I think, like, from 2003 until 2006, we were always, like, one of the teams which were playing like on the first three probably five spots and also reached it and i think we always shot like good performances and also as you said like sometimes they were like um really i would say um unfortunate decisions or plays in some games which really costs us like the really big victory if do you have one in the- mind is one coming to mind is there a big one that you're thinking of when you say that <laughs> yeah east <EWC. laughs> I think it was East WC, I think in 2005, after we won the CPL Swain. Yes, we had the this, one that was won by Complexity, right? It was won by Complexity, but I think like at that time, um, we were like in the uh, world rankings of God Trek on the first place. Oh, you were place. number one. Yeah, yeah, we were number one. Um, I think for two weeks or four weeks before we won the CPL in Spain, where we also beat like Complexity with yes. 30 to two. But then on this East WC, because East WC was like from the rating on, I would say the same level as the CPL, yes. even probably higher because it was only uh, once a year and it was in yes. Europe, and that was also something like you really want to win this. And then we played against, I think it was SK or MTW Denmark. Like the yeah, guy with, yeah. with Wim, Sonic, and yeah, all yeah. the Danish top players. And I think we led something like 10 to 2 on train. 
Then we had also like the pistol rod on the T side, which is always like the T side on train is always very hard to play. And we all, I think we had like a sure. five on two. And then the <coughs> Danish guy, I think it was Wimp, he made a ninja defuse. And I think like when we won this kind of uh, first round, we would have got the second and it would be like 12 to two. And like 13 rounds would be like our um, entrance to the final. And that right. was, I think, the most unfortunate and probably most stupid um, sure. situation I had in my whole career. And that's also something when still, when I think about it, I sure. guess, um, yeah. It's like well, actually, one thing I should ask, because this is a detail people might not know, I'm sure another factor as to how he could do the ninja diffuses, unlike actually even CPLs, ESWC had a stage, they had like a crowd as well, I'm sure, like if people don't know in the modern day, it's the reason why online CS is different, like if you try a crazy play on stage, like it depends on the circumstance, in the modern day, sure, now sometimes fans shout out, back then it's just noise, isn't it? it's very hard to actually know some of the footsteps, some of the sounds, right? Yeah, that was like a problem, but still, I think like our communication was bad because everyone was thinking like the other night, uh, the other one will peak and oh, check if he's the yes. and, But I think like it was our own fault. It was a very stupid fault, and it is. Um, I think if we came to the final, also like after the um, match we had against Complexity um, at the CPL Spain, I think that would have been like a really good chance for us, like to really make like um, the big throw and win such a big like event. Right. One of the things I actually thought was pretty interesting was when you had the next year after this like super team was put together, like it didn't actually last that long, this exact five man lineup, like th so the results started to go down. But listen, because you mouse spots, if people don't know, mouse spots was basically the team like Fnatic in Sweden, you know, you can always just take the next best players. If, you, if your team loses, in fact, usually whoever you lose to, you just take their players, you know, you just go, right, who's their best player? You come join us. So this is what you did, right? You took like a bunch of people in raid and stuff. What would you say about this period? Because it feels like this was like going down a little bit of a level again. Something was off with this team. Like, they were good players, but what do you think the, what do you think the issue? were do you mean like in 2006 or no 2004 2004 i've can't i think we had like this period where we always had like to replace i guess like one player I right think. are you talking about that i might think we yeah, tried think also, so. yeah we tried with raid from mtw or from alternate uh, he was also the best player there who gave us a really tough time at the ESL Pro Series finals. But we, we really had like a big problem like finding the really fitting fifth player. Like we were trying a lot. We also tried then again, I think with Johnny R again. We were always like thinking like what is the best solution? What works best for us? But for some reason, uh, we didn't have like the really, really bad results, but we didn't really get like on the same level as we have been like in 2003. So that was, you're completely right, that was like a period where we struggled a bit and where we were trying to find like the best way like to compete like with the other um, teams in the world and that was more likely like a year to uh, to learn and see like how we get back on track. <laughs> sure. In this team, this particular era, am I right in saying you were the in-game leader? I think like from time to time, I were the in-game leader. We were always switching. We also, ah, okay. like also from time to time, we had in-game leaders for um, like different in-game leaders for different maps. Okay. But I also had like sometimes where I was the in-game leader. Like for, also like for the German national team, I was the in-game leader. And but still, like we were also Roman R did it from time to time. Sure. Neo did it. Like we had a lot of like we we tried a lot out. Maybe that was also like a. Um, a reason for inconsistency during that time, but um, uh, hard to say, like, after 17 years. Sure. Uh, which maps do you remember? Which ones would you call? Which were your favorite maps to kind of call or feel comfortable on? I think at, back then, I think the Stu and Inferno were, like, our strongest maps, and we always struggled on Nuke. I think there was never like a good time for mouse spots during 2003 and 2007 where we felt really comfortable on Nuke, especially when we were playing like Scandinavian teams. But still, like our best maps, I would say. Dusty definitely got to be up there, sure. Yeah, I think Dust 2 was off. always there, but I was also thinking. I think during that time, Cobble was also played, if I remember okay. right. I think we were also like a pretty good cobble team because we had a strong T side for some reason and also like um, good positioning and um, good plays on the CT side. But which maps I'm missing? We had like Nuke, Inferno, Dust 2, Cobble. Train. Ach, Train. Yeah, I think Train was also some map we would rather like skip. I guess at least I, I'd like to do that. <laughs> 
like when you say that, like, you know, the Swedish teams were always, if people don't know, at the time, actually, even though they weren't the super tactical guys, Nuke was famously a map Swedish teams were always amazing at. I'm surprised you would say that, though, because typically, if you think of tactical teams, usually they love Nuke. It's one of their favourite maps. What do you think, what didn't work for the team, do you think, or what couldn't you figure out? Maybe we were, like, too relying on our tactics, which uh, which didn't work, like, in the end, because at also, like, on some maps, you need those indi individual plays of players where you give them, like, freedom, try something out, and that is probably on Nuke maybe some key factor to have success, but for some reason, we didn't find, like, this kind of key factor. We always had, like, problems in finding our game style. Sometimes it was working, sometimes it wasn't, and so it was for us our always like a big issue to get like a consistent performance on that map. I think we always had like a strong CT side, but we always had like problems on the T side, like really to get um, our rounds and get also like confident on that map. I remember in this particular era, these few years we're talking about early on, when you were in the A Losers team, it was you and Neil were the big names. You were the ones who were having the big performances, obviously. Then I remember when you made the super team, it was more like it was maybe, I would say maybe Neo and Gore or something like that. It was these sorts of players that were considered like, you know, the ones you'd watch the POV demo of. But actually, these, this year, when we come into the harder times and going into the next year, you talked about the 2005 with all the good results. I remember this is when people, your name was the one that was actually the foremost. And you were getting voted like maybe the best player or, you, you know, when they do those international polls. This is the, a player that can go head to head with, you know, whoever that's born or something, you know, the best Swedish players. Do you do you feel like yourself you had a career peak here? What was your style? For me, you were kind of a consistent player, right? I think I was a consistent player. I think I um, didn't have like the best um, aiming back then, but I was, I think, I, I still think like I was a um, pretty clever player during that time. I always right. could like read like um, how the opponents are playing, what we could um, do or what I personally can do in specific situations, also like on the T side to find some um, ways for us like to win rounds. And I think that um, always worked very good. I think I was also like on the CT side, a very reliable player. Like it was like very um, rarely that I died on my position without getting like one or two kills at least. And that is, I think, something which um, made my game so that I didn't really have this um, super 3Ks, 4Ks, 5Ks as Neo or Gore. Um, but I think like I was more like the guy you'd like to have in the team because you can rely on him and he will always get like his performance, always get his strength. I think I had like very few really bad days. But you can probably also today see that um, some players have on some maps um, that they really have like um, low stats, low kills and have really like under situations. And I think like I always find like a good way to um, play on my daily feeling. Like when I knew like today I'm hitting re uh, really well, then I knew like I can take like um, more 1v1s or try like different um, peaks, which I usually won't do when I don't really feel like completely comfortable. Then I play like more defensive and I think that was something which a lot of my opponents had like um, problems with because sure. they can't really read such players because it can be like from day to day I'm playing like also very different. That actually sounds very unique, though, dude. That's almost like a sporting approach to it. Like, you know, you have to adapt the tactics because individually, though, because I'll agree with you, I actually think a problem a lot of people had back then is even though we're calling this pro Counter-Strike, a lot of people, let's be good, they just had either really good aim or they just happened to like playing Counter-Strike. A lot of them weren't, you know, putting in hours watching demos or trying to figure out the opponents. So I know a lot of players, actually, they essentially just played the same way all the time. And look, if it goes well and their aim's hitting, yeah. as you say, they'll tear the game up. But if they're doing badly, I mean, infamously, you could have big players who had like 0 or 12 scores why did the game or something be crazy right yeah that was also like when i think one um advantage from my side that i watched a lot of demos like when i knew like i'm playing on inferno like the pit then i was watching like demos from other teams or like players like forest or neo or other like guys probably from um also from four kings harry man like i've i picked like the best players um, from the positions i also played and i watched a lot of demos like their movements what do they do when the opponents um do that kind of um go on that spot and i think that also like helped me a lot to always to don't get like surprised that much because i knew like how the most players are playing and that also helped me like to get my to create my own individual play style which worked pretty well i guess so I tried also like to improve for myself from day to day. And I think that's also one thing which um, really helped me a lot to get this uh, consistent performances over the time. 
One player I definitely want to ask about is the aforementioned Gore, because first of all, I'll set it up for people. The way you know this guy was really good is because Mouse Sports is a German team, and at the time we had the World Cyber Games, you have to have all five Germans, so if you want to win that, you should probably have five Germans, right? So if you're Austrian and they ha- and they just have to have you in the team, you're obviously really good, like you don't want to play against that guy. And this is another thing, right? If I ever made a video, like, you know, most underrated 1.6 players, dude, this guy would definitely be on the list, because if I ask fans now, they're going to list all the famous, but they'll list loads of people who weren't even good by the way, just had frag movies. This guy probably wouldn't get mentioned. I, th- I used to watch all the POVs from EPS, dude. This guy was unbelievable. What do you think? I think, like, he was skill-wise, I think, one of the... F- I think the guys who could, could win the games, like, um, on his own, like, for us. And that was also, like, um, even if we had, like, really tough games, then there's suddenly coming a 3K, 4K from this guy. Like, even, like, in stressy situations, he was the one who could also then step up bring his performance and I think he has a lot of um, good plays. His aiming was really ridiculous. I really liked it and I think he was also like a key factor of the team. Like in general, like we had like a lot of I think um, Neo, Roman, everyone had like a situation where we were like a pretty balanced team. Yes. Like and, and Gore was at that time definitely one of the players who can even have like at that time like 30 kills per map and he was like a really really important part of our team I would even say that's an interesting topic to bring up because again if a team's going to play a structure and, and tactical counter you actually I think it's actually better if you have just like a bunch of good players across a team instead of like you know one or two superstar players because people will see in the game like the best example would be Zewu in Vitality now right if he dies in the round the opponent even knows like whoa our chances of winning this round we'll play you get confident you feel like oh I want to take a 1v1 against the other guy if you have a team like yours now I'll give an example for modern day fans the team Heroic that team like you wouldn't know who you would want to die and who would you be yeah. left in the clutch because all five of them in theory can do something the, 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 the tactic can still work even if a couple die it kind of plays better to this structure I feel like yeah definitely and that was also like uh, one thing like this balanced structure which we had that really helped us um, because we didn't really have like weak spots like you know it like from other teams where you know oh, this guy is playing like ram then we need to go there on the other map he's playing there so probably we should try like to attack there but i think like in our team like everyone knew like how to play his positions everyone had like good skills everyone had like his impact on the games on the matches and i think um, that was also like um, a really good point in our success when you mentioned, obviously, Roman R was another member of this team. Again, he's got the same problem Neo does. Another player came along from the same place called Roman, who was the superstar player. And so people are going to think we're talking about Roman from alternate attacks. Roman R, the one we're talking about, who actually, funnily enough, just joined big with you. I would describe it like this. This guy was just, it, like, I, I thought the way the tweet said it best. He's an icon. Like, the guy, it's like almost like, you know, the Mount Rushmore in America. That should be, if German council, he would be one of the figures there because he was just always there. He was just there for like 10 years or something crazy, right? Who is this guy? I think Roman was also one of the reasons why I joined Mouse Sports because back at that time, like Roman was just like the person you would like to play with. Like he's like this consistent German um, player who had like great appearances at in 2002, also in 2003. And he was, I think, at that time, like also the most consistent player in Germany. You always knew. And he's like also like a very intelligent and smart player. Like, he also, like, taught me a lot of stuff in the beginning when I joined Mouse Sports, like, how to act in specific situations, how to get, like, proper team play. We also played, I think, like, in total, like, 1,000 2v2 matches in some <laughs> German hell, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Just to build that, up team play and stuff. Yeah, also, like, to, um, we also won some prize money there. There was, like, this Giga okay. Liga. <laughs> fair enough. Where we could win. Yeah, that was fair enough. But that was also, I think, for our 5v5 matches, like, a really, really big help because we always knew, like, um, how the other one is acting, how to um, get, like, the best team play out of our um, situations and how to play, like, clutches together. And that's also something, like, he told, like he taught me a lot of stuff, at, le- um, at least in the beginning, which helped me a lot during my whole career. And that was also, as I said before, like, one of the, I think, big advantages or, like, also, be a, like, one of the reasons to join Mouse Sports, like, to learn from this guy. Because I think at that time, I wasn't in the Team Germany, team Germany yet, but I right. knew, like, also from other persons that they uh, really like to play with him because he's also, he's also a nice guy, like, outside the server. And I think, like, 
is a was a, also a very important part of our game. But he's as you said, like he's never like the one who is like in that kind of frag movies with a lot oh, of no. scenes, but he was also like really reliable. He also got like his frags. He was very clever and you could also like have like good um team plays with him together and that is I think something which is also very important for a team which want to be successful for a longer period. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you nailed it at the end there. One concept I always thought was very misapplied in Counter-Strike is, you know, when people talk about the core of the team. Nowadays, people think it just means players that, like, stayed in the lineup through more... Like, so, for example, say, like, the, the silly example would be, say, if you take Na'Vi now, right? If Simple left, but they just kept the same other four and kept recruiting another player in, that's not really the core, because you'd say the core of Na'Vi has to start with Simple. So, yeah. in this sense, for me, Blizzard and Roman were the core of mouse spots. Like, as long as you had those two, yeah. listen, you can bring other the players and depending on how who's got good aim who's playing well and gore maybe these three players this is the core of our spots right this is what you can add pieces and you, you keep the things you've learned the experience sort of builds right yeah i would also agree because roman and me were also like the guys who are doing all of the tactics like most right. of the tactics but like we were preparing like um our practices like also the theory like back then maybe i can also like say that we didn't really have a coach we had to do everything ourselves watch demos ourselves and that was like most of the time that i was like with roman we were talking about um specific stuff like how to improve our um, gameplays how also to learn like from other teams and that was i think as you mentioned then the in this way this was like i think the core of mouse bots during that time now, what's funny is before we get to the really good year where things start to go up again, there was a one tournament I wanted to ask you about because it was so weird at that time. And it was obviously the World Esports Games in Korea. Because first of all, if people don't know, if you go to a tournament in the era we're talking about, it lasts like three days and you just play all your matches. In fact, once you play you play multiple matches a day, you know, you get warmed up, you start rolling, you have a good day, you beat this team, you beat this team, or you, or you lose and you go, whatever, bad day. This tournament was one way. Yet, first of all, it's in Korea. Like, we never used to go to Asia back then. Everything was in Europe or America. And it lasted lasted like a, like a month or something mental. You had to live in like a like a sort of prefabricated chalet house altogether, yeah. not like in hotels or anything. And then you were going to the studio, it was on TV in Korea, and it's like you'd play one match just against that team. And by the way, the setup was, they might even be like right below and in front of you in some weird way in the studio. So like, I remember just, the re first of all, the results of this tournament were all over the place as a result, because like famously, like I'll give you an example, like Rival, the American team, they just basically almost blew their team up because they couldn't handle like all living in one house together. You know, they're all having arguments and fights and because they've never done it before. You just go for three days. So I wanted to know your team famously never really even got to have a chance to win this because you couldn't take the real lineup. I remember I think Gore couldn't go. Famously, you used, if everyone knows Moses now, his brother actually stood in and played at this tournament. Like, oh, hell, I can't yeah. remember, were you in the lineup for this one? Were you actually at that tournament? Yeah, I was there. And um, I think we started there with Gore, Pope, Neo, me, and who was the fifth guy? Was it Toadie? I think you had to take someone else as a fifth, yeah, like as a standard. No, we had to right? replace. We had to replace Gore because Gare uh, got homesick. So, like, he left, I think, after two weeks or three weeks. That, that shows you how long the tournament is. You can get homesick and leave partway through. Yeah, <laughs> and so we, I think, and then we, um, at first, we tried to contact, I think, Moses. But Moses didn't, like, have time during that time. I think he was so doing school he, or something, yeah. Yeah, there was something going on there, and then he told us that his brother might have time. And so I got in, like, in contact with his brother, like, um, and he's like a really, really cool guy. He also sure. said like, he really liked to come to Korea, also to play with us, and was also like a really great experience. But still, it was also, I think, a really difficult time. Because as you said, you were living, like, I think, two hours outside of Seoul. There was nothing, really nothing, like... Um, also for breakfast you get rice, for lunch Very basic you get food, rice, right? for dinner you get rice, yeah. and that is like for European and American guys, it's not um, that what you like uh, yeah, to, yeah. to see like as a living. And uh, we also had then our conflicts like um, inside of our team, and um, so this was uh, a really tough situation. And as you mentioned, I think like today, I think. I can't really imagine that they could like repeat know, like, crazy, like, that they can repeat like this like uh, in two days.
One thing I want to ask quickly about that scenario, though, is because you were bringing in an American player to a German team, like, look, now we can do this interview in English, but back then, like, interviews weren't a big thing. Obviously, scenes were kind of separate. Like, you didn't have to speak English back then. So basically, when he came into the team, I know fans are going to think, you guys probably just spoke English. No, they just kept speaking German. And I even actually talked to her because he was a friend of mine. And he said, like, you made him, like, flashcards. Like, you'd give a little kid who's learning something, you know, in English class. Like, he had, like, cards telling him, like, what you'd say for a dog or something, you know, or, like, you know, this is like, but the problem with that is, look, you can learn a few of those, but he was even like a tactical player. Like you're not going to, it's going to be hard to make tactics work if the guy doesn't speak German, right? Yeah, still like he was a very clever and intelligent player. So it was like really easy, like to integrate him into our team. Like oh, okay. we taught him like what is important and how to play like his role. And I think also like when we had like, I think direct communication with him, we also like um, tried to call in English because like, oh, okay. as you also said, like back then, like, um, I think even um, the English of our um, players were, weren't really the best like back then. And that's also like we were hard also like in stressful situation to call then course, uh, yeah. not with your uh, mother tongue, but like in English. And then I remember, like, as you said, like Sandkasten, like we also <laughs> mentioned him, like the most yes. famous like positions like on all of those maps. And I think they worked pretty well. I think like in the end... Um, I think we placed third, so it was like um, for that lineup there. I think it was like a really, really uh, good outcome. But still, I think like if I have the same decision again, if someone would ask me like it, I think it was in 2004, someone would ask me again like if I want to go like for one month or one and a half uh, half months like to somewhere of nowhere in Korea, then I would probably say that. Sure. Pro- probably next time. <laughs> yes, I think a lot of people would say that based on the stories I heard. Okay, so now we get to the, the really awesome period because an interesting detail here is then we had, funnily enough, same story, another Austrian player comes to Mouse Sports, but he'd already been in Mouse Sports like in the past. And this was obviously Pabst, which is German for Pope, if people don't know. So it used to be written both ways on websites. Like, this is a player where him and Gore and the others, they'd all been in teams in the past, you know. But this is another player, right? It was a very skilled player right? and this is part of what kind of made the mouse sports people might remember the, the one that was a champion yeah definitely like when um, Pabst joined us I think he had like a military break but I think like he joined us like the first time when I joined in um, is that why he had all like shaved hair when he was in the team I remember he yeah, had like a, like, like a military cut yeah because I think like he had a break of like 12 months or 50 right. months like for military service like in Austria and then he came into our team I think for the first time in 2003 but I think then we replaced him with Neo but then also because I think it took a like it took like too much time um for him like to adapt on our playstyle after his break but in 2005 when he joined us again then he was like a completely other players like he knew how to play counter strike and his skill was really even if we had like a one on three one on four one on five you always had to um, be focused against him because he was like our players or player who won probably the most clutches and that was like i think you really really need to be extremely skilled like to uh do like this and pops was always like um skill wise i think also one of our best players Oh, for sure. One of the things I thought was quite cool about this year, so for example, when you went and you won the CPL in Spain, first of all, even though it's like a CPL in Spain, CPL Europe still used to have like the best European teams. They were very hard to win. And if people don't know, it was a big deal to actually become a team that at the time, as you said, it gave you the number one ranking in the world. Because for me, this was the year when like the scene became more professional. Before that, like realistically, it was like the Nordic countries just battled each other for the championship. And then if you did really good, you could come fourth or maybe like one American lineup every now and then could do a miracle run, you know. But this was the year when you could be on top. If you remember, the Koreans started getting good. China started getting good. Brazil, like it felt felt like it was a wide open scene. Right? Anyone could win if they were good enough. Yeah, definitely. I think that was also the time... Um at um, the East RBC, I think that was also like in 2005 where we, I think we played WNV, like the Korean, yes. uh, or the Chinese team where we were yeah. like, we were struggling a lot. I think we were winning like in the end, but that was also like one situation where we saw like Counter-Strike is getting more and more global. Like there are teams coming, as you said, like from South America, from Asia, you never heard of them before, but for some reason they were like very successful and it was i also think like the swedish scene wasn't that dominant during that time i think like the american scene with complexity with fraud like they were like extremely strong but like in general like everything or not everything but like most of the teams like at the top level like the top 10 they were like pretty pretty balanced like every team 
like the map could can decide which team wins in the end or like the um <coughs> I wouldn't say like the daily mood, but the daily performance. So there was like a big chance also like to get like on the first spot during that time. Actually, you've just reminded me of something I should ask you about. If a modern day fan isn't going to understand the format of these tournaments though, because oh, I always, <laughs> yeah, and not only that, but like when they hear that, they hear like, oh, it was best of one. So they think, ah, it was easy to win. I always say in a way, like you, essentially an opposite can happen easier, but there's two factors I want to bring up. I always say, if you look at like people who won everything, like heating and potty or whatever, it's actually harder in a way because it means you can never have one bad map. You have to basically, you can only have one in a tournament if it's double elimination, if you want to win the tournament. So actually in some ways you have to always be on your game. And then this is the detail fans don't remember back in this era you didn't pick the map there was no map veto it's just decided like like mm -hmm. for example if the cpl changes it if like you remember they did like the finals were nuke and then a few years later it was like dust two or something well if you're the best team on nuke that means you can win the cpl if you're not the best team on nuke it's your worst map then it's going to be hard to win that must have made preparing very different in this era right yeah that was also like a some kind of a raffle like also like just as you said like when we um got to a cpl then you see like the bracket you do not see like the teams right away you just see like in the first round you're playing this map in the second round you're playing this map like we had for every match um already like the maps decided for the whole tournament and then then you were always like calculating if we win this then we play against them on then if they win like before and that was also like um i think really uh, a really tough situation because you could um couldn't really like prepare for specific matches because you you never knew like against whom you're playing and it's not as, as as it is like today that you um have one day on tuesday uh, one match on tuesday and on the next day you have like the next match you have like the first best of one at 1 p.m and then the second best of one uh, at 4 p.m and you don't even know at that time against which team you're playing yes. like three hours later so that was also like something like a big challenge for us. What but was for it every like? Team. Yeah. Oh, of course, yes. What was it like then to win this Spain event and essentially be? It's like you're on top of Counter Strike, and as you said, you didn't just win it in the final. You just destroyed Complexity completely. It was easy. Maybe I will start like uh, one month before. I think there were like the NGA finals, like a Ger something like the ESL Pro Series, so just a German event, and I think we placed fifth. So for <laughs> okay. a German, for a German event. We placed fifth. That means, like, for us, like, we were like in big, big trouble. Like, we couldn't like perform really well. We were always also thinking, like, what we can do. Do we need to change something in the lineup? And for some reason, that helped us to like uh, show our best performances. Like one month later at the CB at Spain, where we got like to the tournament. I think we had a really tough first match against some, um, I think, Norwegian team. But afterward, then. We just come, we got like in some kind of run, like everything was working, everyone was hitting, everyone was on point, and it was really like a really cool experience that for some reason no team could beat us at that time. Also, complexity was meant like to be the best team uh, during that period, and we just, I think, we smashed them with 13 to 2 on us 2. I think we had like two, three guys from us winning their one on threes, one on fours. Like every clutch went in our favor because every player from us, from us were on point. And that was also something uh, which we, if we could have asked us like three weeks before or four weeks before after the NGA finals, we were like probably thinking about not even attending the CPL Spain or even the EWC. So that was like, uh, really unexpected but then even more cool situation there and cool event for us all right people are going to be able to guess based on the fact you already told the story of the one key round that went wrong against sk denmark <laughs> and you know you could have been in the final and played complexity and obviously in your mind we just beat them so we'd, we'd have the chance to win it goes out to him, but I'll ask the question. This must have felt like a missed opportunity right this was the chance to like really cement yourselves you could have been a dynasty right Definitely. So as I said, like before, that was like the moment where I'm still extremely unhappy, which I, I don't really like even to talk about. But I think that was like, if you win such a tournament, such an ESWC, you're like in the Olymp, like Olymp of the players and Olymp of the teams, like Olympus. It yeah. Can't be, the, yeah, it can't be the better. Gods. Yes. Like on the really, on the highest level. Yes. And for some reason, yeah, we didn't make it. But that sports, that sports, like we did mistakes. The others didn't did, uh, didn't do the mistakes, and uh, they won. <laughs> 
One thing I want to ask about is when we talked and we set the interview up with talk about the EPS and the German scene, if people don't understand how competitive it is, one thing I've always thought is weird about Counter-Strike is it doesn't matter how good the number one team is when they go internationally. They might even be winning the tournaments. I mean, Sweden showed this. When you come domestically, I mean, the thing is people don't have the same fear. You know, they play you every day in scrims. They play you in all these tournaments yeah. all the time. So as a result, there's, there's actually way more competition sometimes domestically. So famously, actually, sometimes when Mouse Sports was the best team internationally, you'd lose the EPS and that team yeah. and you'd have to go, right, do we have to recruit someone for this team or is the team still good? <laughs> what was that like? It must have been a hard scenario because basically if people don't know, it wasn't until years later that teams were really winning three or four EPS in a row or something crazy. It was always killer at the Lance. I think that's also like a pretty funny story because back then I think I won the only EP, uh, EPS summer with A losers and then with more sports we didn't manage to even uh, win twice in a row. <laughs> Like, okay. so, we all, so we always won like in winter, but in summer we always lose, even though we were like, I think, a really good, even we weren't playing bad, but still like that. For the other German teams, it was always like their biggest approach oh, to win course. against us. It's like so, their like, World Cup final to win that. I isn't think it? Yeah. When, we, when we prepared like one hour for such a game or for such a final, then they prepared probably like 10 hours. Like just right. like they knew everything what we were doing and something like that. It was always like mouse sports in Germany, the team you would like to beat. And I think that was probably also like one of the factors why we lose this or probably also because we were like too self-confident, probably also too arrogant because we do like from the inter international matches uh, what we are capable of. And then we thought like, oh, it might be also enough for Germany. But uh, at many, many times... Uh, it wasn't the way we really liked it to happen, but <laughs> that's also sports. Oh, of course. Right. In the coming years after this, I want to ask a specific question, which goes like this. There was actually another team that rose up that wasn't just good in EPS. It was good in Ashley, which was obviously alternate attacks with Moon and those guys. And famously, you guys just came in. And because at the time, your level results had gone down and theirs were way up. And this is how you know Mouse Sports was like the Man City of, you know, like the EPS at the time. You just took three of their players. It's like you took one. Like you just felt like, I'll, I'll have basically most of your team. But I remember famously, actually, they kept having weird, good results and then this team with your team with like people like Capio uh let me think who else it was um let me think um you mean Silver, Silver was Tixo. The third one. Tixo, Tixo, there we go. These yeah. are the three players, right? Even though this lineup on paper, again, looked amazing. It should have been another super team. There was some sorts of problems, right? You never had the results properly that it should have had. Yes, that was also like a completely new team. Like you had like the three players from um, Alternate Attacks. You had Gore and me from um, Mouse Sports. But I think like it, like in the beginning, like in the first half of the year where I was part of the team, we didn't really find like the perfect roles for the players. I remember back then and I think that was also like the, maybe like a, um, the worst decision of my career that I took over the AWP because I was never an AWP player, but we missed some and then I took it and I think that has like, had like a lot of um, bad impact on my performances and that also showed, I think, um, in our results with the team. But as you said, like on the paper, it looked like really, really strong. Like we took the best players from Attax, we had the best players from more sports and still we didn't manage like to show like good performances. And I would also say like uh, what's also due to my um, low-level performances, I guess, especially with the AWP, which led us to um, this um, low success. When you got to these later years in your career, as, I'm wondering this because you said, like, you know, individually you used to try and adapt depending on how you felt. Did you feel like in the later years, did you try and become what, you know, in the modern day we call them like more like supportive players? Did you try and adapt to what your role was as well? Did you keep doing the same roles, aside from AWP, obviously? I think I tried to adapt, especially like after um, I left Mouseport, that I probably, because I was, I think, the most experienced player in Germany, which was outside of, um, which was not playing for Mouseports. I tried to like help my persons, but uh, my um, teammates, but still, I think like my play style always stayed then the same, especially after Mouseports. But for some reason, I really couldn't like reach the level I had like before. I do not know what was like the reason behind that. Maybe I didn't invest as much time as I should because at the time, like at most parts, especially when I was responsible also for tactics and all of the stuff, you always like take like 10 or 12 hours a day, like to prepare for the match. Like you play a lot of death match and all of the stuff. And that probably 
was one of the reasons after I left Mousebird that I didn't really perform at the highest level again for There's a, a longer couple, period. Sure. There's a couple of players I want to ask about because these are players who famously either never joined Mouse Sports when you were there or never joined Mouse Sports at all. So one that never was in Mouse Sports ever, but if I'm going to list off, again, maybe underrated players, I would put this guy in. It was Moon from Alternate Attacks. Definitely. Because, interestingly, he was an in-game leader, but I tell you what, his demos were fucking good as well. He had like a crazy deagle. He was a, he was a very interesting player. So why did he never join Mouse Sports? Oh, I don't know if this is a secret, but I think like Mousebots approached him several times, but he had like a great loyalty against Alternate. I think right. it was also like Alternate was a team based in Linden. It's still in Linden, where also oh, the okay. company Alternate is. And I think he had like, he was even living there. And I think so. He was, I think, the only player in Germany Mousebots didn't manage to get, even if they tried so. Okay, well, that, scale, wise, it, yeah. scale wise, I can just also say, like, I think if I remember, they also won the WSVG with him, where he yes. had like in every single match really top stats, like he was destroying international yes. top teams by his own. And he was really, I think, like in 2006, 2007, he was probably like one of the, I would say, like in the top three of the best players of the world. Yeah, certainly I'd agree. The other player, it's an obvious one. I referenced him earlier. It was obviously Roman. Now, it, people will know he did join Mouse Sports, but it was right after you were in the team, basically. Yeah. Now, this is a player where, as far as I know, it's kind of like the, the moon story, right? He definitely must have had offers. I mean, this guy, even when he was on smaller teams, he was, he was like the sort of rookie of the year. You could tell, you could see from this demo, this guy's super skilled. In fact, to me, he was always supposed to be like the big superstar of Germany, you know? And like, but what, what reason is, is it that he actually didn't want to join? Why, why was he never in the team? It seems like an obvious player to get. I think that also had some personal reasons, but I don't know. Uh, like he had beef with players or something? He didn't like some of you? No, we always thought like he's some kind of onliner. And <laughs> okay. he's like, we didn't, we, like also like when we played him online during that time, he didn't really show like that kind of performances, which he showed online. Because I also remember like games where we had like on an um, online match against Four Kings with, I think, with MTW, 40 kids. Then they were, like, playing, like, 10 days later against Four Kings again on the same map on Nuke, and they had something like three kids. And probably right. it was this kind of inconsistency between LAN and um, Internet during that time, which um, at least didn't make us, like, to take, like, an uh, approach to Roman and ask him, like, to join us. But later on, I think, um, I don't know, no, do not know when he joined. I think it must be something in 2008. But I th still think back then he really showed like great um, performances also on LAN. One thing that was quite cool, you alluded to it, even when you left Mouse Sports, you would still play some of the EPS because obviously you're already in Germany, you've got the experience. And like I said, if you can get to the land finals, it was usually it was usually a four-team land final. If you can get there, as I said, almost anyone could win. If you have the perfect day, it can happen, Right. I think this is one thing that was very cool about the German scene is because there was still prize money and teams had salaries and there was like the infrastructure was good. It's not like some of the other countries where if you're not in a top team anymore, you just retire if you're like Norwegian or something like that. Ah, you won't play Counter-Strike anymore. I mean, you could have a very long career, right? Yeah, definitely. It was also, um, I had like a really, um, how's it called? Like I always stayed in contact with the uh, managers of uh, mouse sports, also with the players of mouse sports. And like every time when they needed like a player, like a substitute for the EPS finals, they could ask me. They knew that I will then um, play something like 12 hours a day, like to get back in shape. They knew like also got B still, like he's also working for big, like he's uh, playing Varun for big. He still tells me like it was always like really easy to play with me. Also like to get me back into the team because I have like from, um, from the play style, the same mindset. Like I know like how to play like with the team, how to play clutches and all of the stuff. And I think that helped me like to get in a very short time into such teams and always also like be able to help, um, help such teams. And for me, it was also like a, always a great opportunity to show again. I also think like um, for me, the LAN events were also like my strength, like showing there like what I'm capable of because like when I'm playing online during that time, I was... I wouldn't say demotivated, but I didn't have like this 100, 120% of performance, which you show when you are like on LAN. And that was, I think, something which um, I showed like very often for the most sports team that when they need someone that uh, they can always ask me and that I want, uh, that I don't need a lot of time like to adapt again and to come back and help. 
Even though I agree when you said earlier, one of the problems Germany had was like, even when the internet got good, like it's not Swedish good, like obviously Swedish internet's incredible. <laughs> In fact, even Denmark was right next to Germany has amazing internet as well. Like, and though there is two things I will say though, it goes like this. There are two advantages German teams did have on the internet though, Blizzard. One, you're in the best location for the p- servers. You're right in the middle. It's almost impossible for the server to be too, like you can't, like no matter who you're playing in Europe, they have to go to your, sort of near your server. And then the other thing is this, and listen, this might be a touchy subject for Germans, but I'm going to ask for all the other, all the other nationalities of players want me to ask this question from the old school. It goes like this, Blizzard. You know when you would have like online matches or online qualifiers famously for IEM, for example, to go to the land finals, you have to get through this online season. What they told me was this, is anytime you play a German team, right? It doesn't, it's not about just winning the game. You better win the game and you better have every demo recorded. You better have every server <laughs> setting correct. Because they said you guys just knew the whole rule. You know, famously players never read the rule book. German teams knew the whole rule book. And it's like, if you lose, it's like uh, on paper, Page four, section seven, like you didn't actually have one POV, so this is a forfeit match. And listen, there was a German league, like the rules are the rules, right? It's a very German approach. Like, is this true? Were you ever part of this? Yeah, I think rules are rules. Uh, <laughs> I think that's like a typical German mindset. Like when there are some uh, kind of written rules, you will always like um, try to follow them. It's still like the same, I think, today. It's just um, that is, I think, how German acts. But I think with Mousewatch, we didn't really um, try to do the best of the rule book. Like, okay. I think we, we could also like accept if you lost. I hope you don't have like other examples now. No, no, I, no, that was it. <laughs> but I remember that we had like, but that was, I think, with A Losers or Insanity Circuits, like in 2002, where we went to the WWCL final, which was like back then like a LAN series with an online final where we could also win like really good prizes. And there we reached the final without winning any game because we <laughs> made like every opponent of okay. us which won against us, like being disqualified because we knew some okay. players are too young or something like this. So it's somehow a German uh, a German thing. <laughs> Yes, that's an epic story. I will say, making the final without even playing any games, like it's pretty. No, good. we played the games. We lost them, and then oh, you still have to win them, right? I see. Okay. And then afterwards, we saw oh, there's something in the rule book which the admin should yes. uh, have a look at. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Right. Along these lines, though, I wanted to ask, like, you talked in the interview, like a lot of players, well, you know, at this period we have confidence, or winning this result gives it. Were you ever a cocky player? I don't think so. I think like also in the team of mouse bots, I was like one of the more calm players. And I think we had other guys for this cocky parts, <laughs> but I won't mention which one. No, no. But I mean, <laughs> this is one thing I think people confuse. Sometimes people confuse being cocky and confident, right? But I also think they can be separate. Like sometimes you can be confident and believe you're going to win and you've done everything right without being an arrogant guy, right? Were you, were you someone who actually thought like mouse bots should be a champion? We should be number one? I think I wasn't thinking that because I always like honored what the other teams like um, um, are capable of. Also, like during that time, I also <coughs> always taught like my teammates. I always taught also Gore that like, ah, let's play against SK Sweden. They are like the best team. And Gore then said, ah, they are shit. We will win against them. And I was always telling them like, we need to improve life to get better, to get on that level. And I was always like the guy I... Also, like when I got voted like to the best players of the world, I always thought like, oh, I'm not that good or something like that. Like, and then I always wanted like to improve, and I think that always helped me like um, to get uh, on the better level. But still, I think in the game I was confident because I knew what I what I can. But still, I thought like there's still like better players out there, which always like helped us and I think also our team um, to always um, try to focus, to show your best, and always that we have the need to improve to um, get better. Over your career, is there one team that you played against that stands out? This is my favorite team to play against. Could be because it was easy, could be because it was amazing games. Is there someone who's a great enemy that you can tell us? I think the great experience I made were always the teams when you played like against Element, like Ola, because they were like... um, Tactical wise, really, really hard to play. They made so many unexpected but good things. That was also like a great experience, and maybe not like a great experience um, that we win in the end. But um, from the kind of um, expectations which you have when you are playing against such teams, and but I think like despite that. 
For me, it was always nice like to play against MTW, but that was like a domestic thing because I always had some trouble like with them, like um, in the communication, like we did some trash talk against each other. Like MTW also like said every player who knives me on a um, on an EPS final gets like uh, 50 euros. Uh, okay, that sounds annoying. Yeah, it sounds annoying, but for me that was like some kind of motivation because I always um, think. Uh, I said some things which uh, wasn't like in the which the managers of MTW didn't like, and then we always had like some kind of really tough matchups, which are not like just like the on the competitive level, yes. but also like on the emotional level. And that is yes. also something which was like an additional challenge. But I think like um, <clears throat> for me, it was always like um, a thing like to give more than one hundred percent to win and. I think that are some cool stories, like if I think of them like 20 years later. Yeah, this also, that's perfect segue, because if people don't know, this is where the interview might seem weird if you're not a, an old school fan. Element, the great Norwegian player, played in mouse sports. He actually came to Germany, joined the team. It was one of the rare examples of like, it's essentially, obviously, everyone knows now in European soccer, you know, you go wherever you want. But back then, it was obviously everyone stayed in their separate regions, which kind of shows, by the way, how much money was in the scene, how professional it was. But I, I've even done an interview with him, asked these questions. Don't worry, he is someone where now he's grown up. He'll admit, like, you know, he was a kid and stuff. Here's the problem, Blizzard. I remember when he joined this team, he'd already been, done this little like loop where after he'd been in SK, he'd been in NOA, then he was in like, I think, MIBR, then he was in Four yeah. Kings in the UK. And he was like, mate, he was just like hopping around the scene because at the time he was like a bit of a part. Yeah, you know, he just had friends that were different players. And the problem was this. I remember saying actually at the time when he announced he was going to join Mouse Sports, like, dude, this one won't work. Like, like it's already bad enough you're trying to play like with Brazilians when you don't speak Portuguese. Look, you maybe play with the UK players. That might be all right. But I said, there's no way you're going to work in a tactical team because I know you don't know German. And here's the thing. I remember in the interviews, he all promised like, oh, I'm going to do my homework. I'm going to have like a tutor. Like, <laughs> tell me the truth, Blizzard. I don't think he ever learned German. Like, it's Seemed like he it seemed like he was a bit lazy was he i think he wasn't lazy i think like um because i think norwegian and german there's not like they're pretty much connected like a lot of oh, words okay. are um like pretty understandable for ola and he's a very very smart guy i've sure. always been like a great fan of him and his um play styles um we had, I think, some um, issues in the beginning because we were then switching completely to English, also like English calling oh, okay. during the game, also doing like the English um, tactics and all of this stuff. And that was um, always the thing which Ola took care of. And I also think like the beginning of the um, time of Ola being in mouse sports was really, really successful. I think we didn't uh, lose the map for, I think... 30 games or 30 matches i don't know but like we had a really decent start but the end wasn't like i think that good but that was also because alternate attacks was like a very very tough opponent during that time so in total i would think like that was a really cool experience also playing with him together also learning a lot of stuff from him because he was i think the first super super superstar like um coming to germany and still i think um, he was a great help for the team Maybe we could have been a bit more successful in the end, but in total, I would say like it was the right decision to try it out. After this team, when obviously the Gobby and Six, these players came in, it was a different era of mouse sports. You know, we switched to a different set of teams and, you know, you came back in briefly years later. But like what happened in this scenario? Were you actually cut from the team? Were you kicked? Did you choose to leave? What, what, how did Blizzard leave mouse sports? Because if people don't realize, along with Roman R, like you were the players that have been in the team the whole time, basically. So like you were mouse sports. So if these players leave, it's a big shock. How, how did it come that you left mouse sports? I think that's also a bit connected to the era of element because the element decision was one of, uh, I wouldn't say it was my own decision. Like I also like talked to our management and also to the other players, if we can try it off with um, Olaf, that didn't work out well during that time. And because this didn't, uh, when I uh, didn't go well, we, um, the mouse sports management approached KPO and KPO then like took over the role, which I had at mouse sports for like three or four years like um since almost i joined and then capi was like the one who was then um responsible for team decisions like still he had to talk to the management but still like um after my poor performance in 2007 in the first um half of the year they i would say i got kicked like the mouse sports management wanted to keep me like on the bench but um i think it wasn't my decision to leave mouse sports but i think i wasn't 
that I, I wasn't that unhappy, uh, unhappy to leave the team because I knew like something isn't working. That wasn't also that uh, kind of fun, like playing together. So in the end, I think it was uh, the right decision for both parts. Oh, okay. That's a very mature answer. The next year when they had all the success, they won the Extreme Masters and they were one of the best teams in the world again, right? Listen, it's only human nature, so I want to ask, were you cool with that? Were you, did you feel a bit like, oh, it should be me? Were you bitter? Did you think like, oh, fuck? What, what, what you, how, how did you feel about seeing your former teammates have success? I think it's like a really natural like feeling that you, when you see them on the stage, you see them like wearing the Mousepad jersey, you don't really feel like comfortable but still like i'm friends with more of the players back i was friends and still uh, i'm still friends with uh, many of them i was happy for them but i would have been i think more happy if i would also be i would have been a part of the team so but <laughs> i don't know how much cs go you watch but in cs go god b actually unfortunately had really bad stats in the game he was basically it's like he was almost just a brain at this point in time he had amazing <laughs> strats and he was doing some crazy shit but I even know by the way it's just like his skills had gone because I, like famously some friends of mine for example went and visited when he was in certain teams and he was still practicing loads he was deathmatching all day long but it's, for some reason it's like aiming wasn't very good you know, it's basically his skills had degraded the reason I set this up like this is because modern day CS fans only know that Godby they think he's just a guy with tactics I want to ask you this who was Godby in CS 1.6 I always tell people mate he was doing tactics but like you could have just watched the POV devil he had some amazing games right I think God B was a revolution for I think the whole CS scene because he bring so much stuff like on a new level like he was skill wise a very very good player he wasn't probably on the he wasn't on the level of a six or some other like really formed the skill but still like he was getting his skills also winning a lot of rounds uh, with the skill but what made him um the very, very outstanding player was his, um, he knew all details of the game. He was telling like every single player how we should run. Like we were practicing some just do uh, moves where I really knew like in which direction I should look when, I, when, I'm, um, when I'm there, like 20 seconds late or 20 centimeters later, I need to watch like there because then they are coming the flashes from long and then they are coming from CT base. So he really like, um, he knew all of the details. He knew all um, how to react on specific game strides. Like I think that was, I thought like I did a lot of tactic stuff, but then I played together with him, like also as a stand-in for Mossbot. That was like a complete uh, new experience. He also like his flashes, like his smokes. Like I think there was no guy like him during that period investing so much time in trying things out, like being alone on the server, trying smokes trying flashes and that was really like a revolution for the um, CSGO, um, not CSGO, CS 1.6 scene. It must be then a little bit surreal to be back in an organization where it's you, it's Roman R, yeah. it's got B. It almost feels like it is sports now. Like, you know, obviously if you're like Bayern Munich or something, if you're a legendary player, you can be the coach or the, you know, the president or something, you know, you can get to these positions. It's like, that's a natural order. You bring these guys back in. Is it, has it been um, interesting to, to come back now and try and reinvent yourself? Mm. My problem was that after, I think I won the EPS <clears throat> finals in 2009 and that was the last match i played in counter-strike in 1.6 and csgo for over 10 years so i left the scene totally for 10 years i didn't watch like any game i didn't right. play anymore and then i started also also with roman r we started i think like two or three years ago together with the management of um, big um, to watch some big matches and then i still found it like interesting like the new components like the smokes the flashes are different then you have the molotov and there were like so many, many new stuff. And I think it would take a lot of time for me to um, adapt again and also see like the advantages of um, such a game as CSGO. And I think for me, I think it was too late. I think Roman is much better in such cases. And I think um, he's also doing a great stuff at the new head of CSGO for the, um, for the big team. But still, like for me, I think I'm in a far better position now, like for my individual um, needs. What do you do for mouse uh, big rather? What, what would you? <laughs> how would you describe your role? Uh, basically, like um, for like three months, I'm here as the chief operation officer. So I'm responsible like for every single department, also for gaming. 
but um, if I would take this um, role more serious, then I would um, put myself into the lineup. <laughs> okay. But also like for other for the other stuff, like the merch, like we have boot camps, boot camp rooms here, which we um, rent to other teams. And so basically I need to um, work with the management together to bring um, a big on a good road, like for the next years, like... Um, Basically, I'm there for the uh, success of the operational departments of BIG. When, the the yeah. when in CSGO, for example, as you say, the Molotov was added, the smokes are like way bigger and they last a lot longer than 1.6. Like basically, at the time, I remember hating it. A lot of players did at the beginning because we didn't know how to use these things. But I will say, it does mean if you're a really tactical team, it's another way to like even up the odds against more skilled players. So I, I have to say, when I see those elements, I want to know if you agree. I think if you if, if I could take those elements and put them in 1.6, it would be your teams. It would be the German teams. It would be God, but you'd love these factors, right? You would, if, you would have done so much with Molotovs and better smoke grenades, right? In 1.6, if they existed. Yeah, I think so. Because we were always like a team which tried to uh, get the most out of the game. Like we didn't want to rely on our skill. And then we would also use like anything, um, especially like Molotovs, like to put them as a new factor, like to our um, play style, also to um, find new solutions for different situations. and. I think that would have been like a really cool stuff for us, like because it's a new element, and I think we would have tried like to um, probably exploit the element as much as possible, because we were always like for every technical thing. I think we were um, investing a lot of time to use that, and so would be like the Molotov or like the other smoke grenades or other, or the, even the flash grenades, which are like um, pretty different. Right. Obviously, we've mentioned a lot of the great names and teammates in this episode. I wanted to ask this, though, since, as you said, there were so many players in EPS and not all of them made it to mouse spots. Is there another player that we haven't mentioned that either you wish you'd played with or they could have come at some point in time? It just didn't happen. Is there someone we haven't mentioned that we should mention? Yeah, probably from the um, lineup back then at the A losers. When I think like of Voodoo or Don Camillo, which like which were like very skilled and great guys. I think especially like Voodoo, his AWP skills were like outstanding during that period uh, period in Germany. We were also thinking, I think, of getting him to more sports as well. But I think in total, like uh, or Chef Koch. I think Chef Koch. He right. was like, I'm still. Very surprised how he could be that successful because, like, in my opinion, he uh, wasn't really, like, the skilled player, but he was also, like, very smart. He was also um, very good in leading young players together with Moon, like, um, developing young players, getting them um, them on the highest level. And I think he's, I think, also, like, one of the icons from German 1.6 um, history. And just as a random question, now that CSGO is big and people have this new interest in Counter-Strike again, because for a while, you know, things like StarCraft, League of Legends, which is way bigger games, Dota, etc. Do you actually find, because you said you were out of the game for so long. I'm sure when you were out of the game initially, probably almost no one ever recognized you or say, oh, you're from Counter-Strike, because it's not like it was an international thing, you know, it was like you had to be a nerd. Do you actually ever get any sort of like people who are like, oh, you played 1.6? Like, did you have? Is there more interest in Counter-Strike in Germany now, do you think? I think, like, especially because of those, um, this ESO One Cologne. I think I've visited it like three years ago together with Jengis uh, from More Sports. And if, I think I could have never imagined like such an event um, like 15 years before. Like, I, I remember it from, um, from this um, WEG, which you mentioned before, when you've been to Korea or to. Um, um, to China because in China and Beijing there were like the finals of it and it was the first time when I saw like a crowd coming to me they wanted right. to have autographs but in Europe or even in America that wasn't like even you couldn't imagine that this would happen and then I saw like the crowd at the um, ESL One Cologne and so I think like it really changed a lot the, like the professionalism um, grew a lot and I must definitely say that I think also like for Germany, um, there happened a lot in the last 15 years. And I think like also like the ESL is one like of the, like we are really happy like to have this um, company in Germany who is really pushing the German scene um, as much as they can. And I think they are doing like a really great job. 
since as I at the beginning of the interview set it up that you had the EPS in Germany and you had all these finals, and as I said, there could be very, very legit prize money. Like the prize money could be like, you know, the equivalent of second place at a CPL, but just only German teams playing. What people might not know is back then, even the great Swedish teams, unless you basically were the, the number one Swedish team and you won everything, no one really made like big money or anything. You know, like they were actually earning, for, it's just, it was cool to be a pro player. You know, no one was, like Heaton wasn't making like $100,000 a year. So he was maybe making like 30000 if he had a really good year, you know. I saw when I looked at it, between salary and just, just the EPS and the other tournaments, you guys must have been making pretty good money during your careers. I mean, you must have been around the same level, right? So was it actually, like, did you actually have, a, did you actually consider it a good job at the time? Were you one of those guys where it's like, we'll do it just because I love the game? How, how successful do you consider that part? I think we were, like, really successful at that time. As I said, like, we got also, like, a good income from the German events. It's, like, the ESA Pro Series, definitely, because, as you mentioned, I think we had, like, 15,000 euros as prize money plus some um, bonuses. But we also had, like, an NGL. NGL was something, like, similar, where you also had, like, I think, two seasons that you could win, like, 10 or 12,000 yes. euros a month. So, um I think we really had like a good life during that time because we were also like getting a salary from all sports, not a big one, but still like a salary where you can um, live from. But like when you add the prize money of all of these domestic tournaments plus the tournaments which we um, played in internationally, I think we had like a very, very good life. And um, I think during that period, that was also like something, as you said, was a good thing for Germany and for the German esports. If this was an interview with someone else and I said, I've mentioned Blizzard, how, how would you like people to remember Blizzard? Should he be considered an icon? Would you like to be considered the, the German Counter-Strike player? How do you consider Blizzard and over his career? How would you like people to remember you? I think that's a good question. <laughs> I think like uh, I was always trying to be like the nice guy, like the guy who um, tried to do the best out of his skill who tried like to um, help also the German um, um, CS and esports scene like to develop. Like I was like the guy doing a lot of um, interviews for televisions. Um, also like when we had these tragedies with um, a lot of deaths like air fraud or like I was always like the face for German esports. Right. Like I was like for the in the television I was like the bad guy playing like those Amok games like those okay. uh, horror games and such stuff and I think that's also something that I would like to be remembered like this like the guy who tried like to help like to help like the CSGO scene and who also like um, tried to always perform best when playing for more sports but also like playing for the uh, German national team and that I was I think in most of the uh, situations the guy you can uh, rely on and that is something I think that would be cool if other persons would think of me like that Actually, I have a question that you just made me think of there when you mentioned that, because I should have mentioned that. Even though in Counter-Strike, there was this professional scene, big prize money, even like the beginnings of things like ESL TV, streaming and stuff was starting to come around. The the thing that was always bizarre to me as someone who wasn't from Germany is I didn't know this until I would I would ask my friends in Germany and they were like, oh, you have to understand though, like we can never be mainstream because in Germany, like famously in Counter-Strike, they, they took the blood out and it was all green or whatever, you yeah. know, because of these like school shootings or whatever, whatever it was, something like that. Yeah. They, Basically, they people know the Americans did that in the media, but in Germany it was almost like even like the government was involved in something. Going, oh, are these games acceptable? It's like it was a bit, kind of a stigma against being playing these games, whether it was Quake or Counter Strike, right? Yeah, definitely. Because during that time, we always had like the uh, problem that um, the government could have forbid like to play like Counter Strike on a competitive level. And you can imagine what that uh, would mean to us, but also like for the ESL, because I think during that time Counter Strike was like the biggest. Um, Esports um, game, and if like the government says no, sorry, um, you aren't allowed to play that anymore. That would be like a really, really um, tough thing, like for us. But fortunately, that didn't um, happen, and I think like um, a lot of persons worked on that. That it didn't happen, and but that was always something that I think it still needs like probably 10, 15, 20 more years until like um, we get older, we get like in um, I wouldn't say more responsive, more serious um, 
positions so we can decide because in germany you have a lot of very old politicians who sure. do not really know who do not really can accept that there's also some kind of gaming some kind of gaming probably with violence but they don't accept that um Uh, normal persons can um, distinguish between um, violence in a game and real violence. But that is something I think we have only in Germany and maybe we can also change that like in the next decades. That would be great, yeah. Okay, yeah. Who, are you, were you actually also, I mean, listen, every German is, but I'll ask anyway, were you a fan of football? What, who's your team? Football? Like since I'm living in Berlin for now 20 years, I am supporting Hertha BSC. But as I was um, born in Munich, I'm also like, especially when it's going to international matches, of course, Bayern Munich. Then I have a question. And I think this will be the perfect way to describe if someone's more of a football fan, they didn't see you play. Here's the question. Which German player can be any era? Who would Blizzard be if he was a football player? What was your style of counter strike if I transported it to, sit, to football? Who would it be? I think probably Kimmich. Because Explain like why. Kimmich, like probably... Kimmich, Joshua Kimmich, like the player from Bayern Munich, like he's playing like a defensive spot, doing his work, also like telling his teammates what to do. And he's something like something like the heart, like the heart of a team, but he's not like outstanding with scoring goals like Lewandowski or like, um, yeah, he's not the top technician, like probably Lilo Sané or other guys, but he's like the one who's holding everything together, trying like to improve the team and who's always like trying to be there when it's needed at the end of this interview do you have a final message or is there someone you'd like to thank or maybe shout out yeah first of all i would like to thank you for the opportunity and i would also like uh thank like um to my new stuff like at big that the um get me back into my esports career because that is something like if you started with esports and then you are getting back after such a long time it's really really cool and i think it's challenging but i'm like really happy to be here also to be in such interviews with you now and yeah basically i'm would also thanks uh i'm very thankful to the community because i saw my um announcement post i saw a lot of very nice comments and I'm also very happy that a lot of people still remember um, me from back then. And even though it's like 15 years ago, and I'm re really looking forward to having a lot of um, cool events of esports in the future. Like probably like when this shitty Corona situation is over, I'm really grateful to also like um, meet a lot of the fans from the community again, like um, in real life again. Danke schön. <laughs> Gerne. This video was kindly supported by Ahmed Hadju, Iskander, Matt Pugnacio Rakula, Tukan, Travis Goff, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Butt Pounder 420, Hades, J Dubs, Jensen Gore, Joy, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, Zyrathenia, and a special thanks goes out as always to Jerky's Minion, but also to Jeremy Dahl. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? You want to ask me a question for one of my video airmares? Want teasers? find out who the guests are would you like to take part in a lengthy esports discussion with me well if so put your money where your mouth is and join the scaluminati today via the patreon link in the description box below